I'm Lynn. Welcome all of you to English Practice Channel. Today, we practice many listening lessons are called passive listening. Passive listening is how we get used to the native speaker's accent without focusing too much on the meaning of each word. It'll like the way we enjoy an English song with a clear melody. If we practice listening again and again, we will feel the sound and pronunciation. Now, we start our lesson. Exercise 1 Dr. Barrett, Sammy, come in. Is Irene with you? Yes. Good. Sit down. Right. We're looking at how far you've got with your research project since we last met. Uh, you decided to do a survey about computer facilities at the university, didn't you? That's right. We decided to investigate the university's open access to a computer when they need one, so we thought it would be a useful area to research. Good. It's not a topic anyone has looked at before, as far as I know. Uh, so it's a good choice. So what background reading did you do? Well, we looked in the catalogs in the library, but we couldn't find much that was useful. It's such a specialized subject. Hardly anything seems to have been published about it. And as well as that, the technology is all changing so quickly. But the Open Access Center has an online questionnaire on computer use, that it asks all the students to do at the end of their first year, and the supervisor give us access to that data. So we used it as a starting point for our research. It wasn't exactly what we needed, but it gave us an idea of what we wanted to find out in our survey. Then we designed our own questionnaire. And how did you use it? We approached students individually and went through our questionnaire with them on a one-to-one -one basis. So you actually asked them the questions? That's right. We made notes of the answers as we went along, and actually we found we got a bit of extra information that way as well. About the underlying attitudes of the people we were interviewing, by observing the body language and things like that. How big was your sample? Well, altogether, we interviewed a random sample of 65 students, 55% male and 45% female. And what about the locations and times of the survey? We went to the five open access computer centers at the university, and we got about equal amounts of data at each one. It took us three weeks. We did it during the week, in the day and in the evenings. Not the weekends? No. So, presumably, your respondents were mostly full-time students. Yes. Oh, you mean we should have collected some data at the weekends from the part-time students? We didn't think of that. Okay. It's just an example of how difficult it is to get a truly random sample. So, how far have you got with the analysis of results? Well, everyone agrees there was a problem, but we're more interested in what they think should be done about it. The most popular suggestion was for some sort of booking system. About 77% of the students thought that would be best. But there were other suggestions. For example, about 65% of people thought it would help if the opening hours were longer, like 24 hours a day. Exercise 2 I'm on holiday and I'd like to hire a car to travel throughout Britain. That sounds great. I wish I were going. Where do you plan to visit? Well, I'm going to look at some top tourist spots, Stonehenge, the Welsh Valleys, and I'd like to get right up to the north of Scotland to see the highlands around Inverness. Maybe I'll even get some great pictures of the Loch Ness Monster. That's the reason I'm hiring a car. I mean... I love the freedom to go where I please and really make the most of my stay. I see. Well, you've come to the right place. Book your holiday through our agency and you'll benefit from the help of expert consultants like me. 
we can offer you the best deals going. We use only the most respected international car hire companies. I'm sure we can find just the right car for you, and if you pre-book before you want to go, that'll guarantee that the most suitable car will be available. And we make what we call our price pledge, too. In the unlikely event that you find a lower price with another international car hire company for an identical car, we'll match it. That means we'll refund the difference between what you've paid us and the offer from the other company. Can't say fairer than that, can you? Anyway, could you tell me more about the cars and, obviously, the insurance? I'm going to be driving several thousand miles, and I need a vehicle that will go the distance and not break down. Don't worry, sir. You're in good hands with us. We're one of the UK's largest car rental companies with a track record of over 50 years' experience. Our standards of service are unrivaled. Our cars are on average six months old and are subject to regular safety checks and maintenance. Er, about the insurance. Our higher rates include full insurance for all collision damage. Mind you, the careful driver's got nothing to worry about. Statistics show that Britain has the safest roads in Europe. One of our customers been driving for 35 years without an accident. And that's not unusual these days in Britain. That's reassuring. So, what do your higher rates cover? Are there any extras? There are no hidden extras with our company, unlike some which I could mention, but mustn't. Our rates are fully inclusive and give you unlimited mileage, plus insurance against theft and, as I said, collision damage. Also, there are no fees for amending or cancelling your booking, so you're free to decide what to do. What about picking up and dropping off the car? We have collection points at town centers throughout Britain and at all the airports, which are open during office hours. If you prefer, your car can be delivered to and collected from your accommodation. That sounds fine. I would like the car to be delivered, but I'll take it to the airport myself when I go back to China. Uh, I'd be interested to know about various models I could hire. We can offer five types of cars. If you wanted a hatchback, you could hire a five-door or a three-door. Both of them have power steering and airbags. The larger one also has air conditioning. You know, a hatchback is a car with a door at the back that lifts up. Yes. What are the alternatives? The first alternative is our four-door sedan. Or, if there are only two of you, you might like our two-door open-top convertible model. It looks like a sport car. The other two alternatives are a bit different. If you want to go on rough country roads or off-road, we have a very good four-wheel drive vehicle. We haven't decided how many people will be going yet. Some friends might want to come with us. So, finally, could you tell me the prices? All our rentals are calculated in three-day periods. The people carrier costs 180 pounds. The sedan, 135 pounds. The hatchback, 63 pounds. The small hatchback, 47 pounds. And the two-door convertible, 111 pounds. Excellent value, all of them, especially if several people share. My thoughts exactly. I'll be in touch with you in the next few days to let you know which model I'll take. That'll be a pleasure, sir. Please take a copy of our latest brochure with you. Exercise 3 The world's energy comes from a number of different sources, which may be broadly classified into two categories. The first, which includes fossil fuels and minerals such as oil, coal, natural gas, uranium, etc., comprises sources of energy that are non-renewable. The second category, which includes the wind, the waves, the tides, the temperature of the oceans, and the sun, 
comprises sources that will continue to provide energy in virtually unlimited quantities as long as the Earth and the Sun exist. And yet, despite the fact that they are to all intents and purposes inexhaustible, the sources of this second category remain almost untapped. Most energy is produced today by burning hydrocarbon fuels drawn from the world's non-renewable reserves. The amount of these potential reserves, by which is generally meant the quantity that can be extracted by present or conceivable future techniques, is a matter of some controversy. This is understandable. If we consider the enormous difficulties involved in determining how much fuel nature has hidden in the earth, and how much of it is or will become accessible, and the fact that different countries use different methods of estimation. Proven recoverable reserves, i.e. those whose extraction is already an economically feasible proposition, are considerably smaller. The great difference between potential and proven recoverable reserves is explained by the fact nature has placed so much of this fossil fuel in remote parts of the globe, at depths and in quantities that makes its extraction unjustifiable at present in economic terms. Let us now compare proven recoverable reserves with estimated consumption. Between now and the year 2010, the quantity of energy required by the world will account for almost 10% of its proven recoverable fossil fuels. If no other source of energy is employed, 78% of these fuels will have been used up by the year 2050, while a hundred years later, according to the most moderate long-term forecast, there will be none left. Comparison of consumption with potential reserves produces a somewhat brighter picture. By the year 2010, the demand for energy will have used up only 3.6% of these reserves, and by 2050, 26%. A century later, about half of these reserves will still remain. These comparisons clearly show that the world's stock of chemical fuels is quite sufficient to cover its energy requirements for at least another hundred years. There is thus no immediate danger of, as it were, emptying the coal bucket. On the other hand, these reserves of fuel are limited, and within the foreseeable future there could be none left. It is possible that our children's grandchildren might find themselves in a world drained dry of natural gas and oil. We should thus lose no time in thinking about ways and means of producing artificial oil or artificial gas, and above all, of producing energy in unlimited quantities from sources which in no way threaten the environment. Exercise 4 Dr. John Ray has windmills on the mind, but these are not fantasies for tilting at nor idle daydreams. As chief scientist at the Department of Energy, it is Ray's task to keep Britain switched on to alternative sources of electricity and fuel. From wave machines to sun-powered cars, he is the one who must examine all the options. And windmills, Ray believes, are among the most promising. There is a drawback. Wind power is greedy for land. At Altamont Pass in California, nearly 7,000 windmills cover 23 square miles. Yet, when they're all working at peak production, total output is 1.2 gigawatts, only about the same as an ordinary power station. It was the dramatic rise in the price of oil during the early 1970s that inspired Britain's so-called renewable energy from natural environmental sources which never run out, including those such as wind and tide, unlike coal or oil. The programme researches and demonstrates new techniques to industry, persuading companies and institutions to take them up. The flow of oil from the North Sea has taken the urgent edge off finding renewable energy. 
Research into renewables has a budget of 14 million compared to the 200 million for nuclear power research. However, Ray reckons he would have difficulty spending a bigger sum sensibly at the moment. Most of the cash goes to the onshore wind, tidal, and hot dry rocks projects. Ray claims Britain is an international leader in the latter, which gets its name from the hot rocks beneath the Earth's crust that are a source of its energy. Water is pumped down under pressure, passed through fractures in the hot rocks, and pumped back up again. Estimates of the potential vary widely, but some say there may be enough hot rocks under Britain to power the country for nine years. The tidal option seems the source which nature intended Britain to pursue. In the Severn Estuary, we have one of the best sites in the world for tidal power, says Ray. The proposed 5.5 billion Severn barrier on its own could produce a peak of 7.2 gigawatts over one year, equivalent to almost 5% of Britain's energy consumption. But there are big problems. Tidal power comes in surges twice a day. Unfortunately, no battery is big enough to store the amount of power produced at a surge. This is the universal curse, says Ray. So instead, the barrier must be geared to supply a much lower level of power consistently. This reduces its capability to 1.1 gigawatts, the equivalent of just one conventional power station. Realistically, the total amount of energy we could expect to get from tidal power, even looking 20 years into the future, would be 8%, Ray says. Exercise 5 I've been living in London now for three years, and I still don't think I've got used to it. Life is, well, very impersonal here. People in the south of England are rather unfriendly compared with people in the north. I come from a rather small town in Lancashire called Ormskirk. It's close to both Liverpool and Manchester. So, perhaps I'm just not the sort of person to live in a place like London. For one thing, I find it's very difficult to talk to people here about anything. They're all so indifferent. Perhaps it's because they get so tired just travelling to and from work. In Ormskirk, I had plenty of friends. Here in London, I have very few friends. In fact, I don't think I have any. Acquaintances, that's what they are. Acquaintances. I know a lot of people, but I haven't any friends. Perhaps it's my fault. Or perhaps it's just the place. I was born in a small village in the west of Ireland, near Cork, and personally, I couldn't wait to get out of it. I came here when I was 18. I actually stole the money to come here, although I have paid it back since. People say village life is so much better than life in a city like London. Half the people I know here in London say they would prefer to live in a village somewhere. But I think they have a very unrealistic idea of what life in a village is really like. In most villages, people gossip about each other all the time. They've nothing else to talk about. They've nothing else to do. It's impossible to keep anything private for long. Your life is everybody else's property. Now, I don't like to say anything very nice about the English, but I must admit they're more tolerant than the people back home. People in small villages who've lived there all their lives are very intolerant, you know. They think everybody should be the same as they are. Here in England, well, here in London at least, people really don't care what you do, what you wear, or how you behave, as long as you don't actually disturb them. Now, I don't know if that's tolerance or indifference, and I don't really care, but I think I've made a lot of friends here. Well, many of them are Irish, like myself, but I have some English friends. It isn't difficult to make friends in a place like this, as long as you're prepared to make contacts, to talk to people. 
It's no good just sitting in your room and waiting for people to come to you. You've got to go out to them. And if you don't, it's not their fault. You haven't any friends. It's yours. Exercise 6. Good morning. This talk is about studying in the UK and choosing the course that is right for you. There's a huge amount of choice of study courses in the UK. Over 200,000 courses are available on every subject you could mention, and some you possibly couldn't. What I'm going to do is outline for you five factors you should take into account before you make your choice. That is the way to find which course will help you most to become the best that you can be. The first factor is time. Make sure you give yourself enough time to plan your decision. Rush decisions are usually bad ones and may be disappointing and expensive. Take enough time to get the information you need from colleges, universities and training institutions. They usually have websites which provide lots of information and they are happy to reply to questions by email. But you need time to find the websites, download the information, consider it and, very important, talk it over with friends and family. If you are going to study in the UK, you must be serious about your future career, so it's important to make the right decision. Take time to think about why you want to study in the UK and what you hope to achieve. Plan your career goals. Actually write them down. Here are some suggestions. 1. To start a career. 2. To build your CV. 3. To gain expertise. 4. To broaden your skills. Let me repeat them for you. They're important. 1. To start a career. 2. To build your CV. 3. To gain expertise. 4. To broaden your skills. Once you have defined your goals, you'll find it easier to narrow down your choices. Remember that you'll usually have to apply for a course between September and December and start the following autumn. Applications for medicine, dentistry, veterinary science and for any course at Oxford or Cambridge need to be in, that is, received by the university, by the 15th of October at the latest. The second factor is to get a wide range of information. Don't just go by your first ideas. They may be out of date or plain wrong. You should consult a good reference book, such as the Guide to UK Education. You can also get brochures called prospectuses from any UK institution. These provide a great deal of further information. Be sure to ask if you have questions that aren't answered in the literature. You should also consider ranking information. Higher education institutions in Britain must publish the scores they get from the government for their teaching, research and other factors such as spending on facilities and graduate recruitment rates. Of course, you shouldn't make your decision on rankings alone. Some top-ranked institutions may not be the best in your subject area may not offer the sort of placement opportunities you're looking for or the kind of student environment that would best suit you. Factor three is more personal. First, ask yourself if you are really interested in the course once you have found out exactly what it involves. Full-time demands sustained effort and strong motivation. Secondly, Get to know what methods of study your course will require. Some of these may be unfamiliar. As well as traditional lectures and demonstrations, you may also have to take part in seminars, undertake practical exercises, attend individual tutorials and go on work placements and field trips. Be sure 
that you feel comfortable with the study methods of the course. Thirdly, find out how you will be assessed. It could be on coursework alone, exams, practical work, or a combination of these. The fourth factor you should consider is the place itself. What sort of environment would you like? Do you prefer the action and excitement of the big city, such as London and Manchester? Or would you like to settle down in a more peaceful place, where the student community might be smaller? Would you choose to live on a self-contained student campus, or be closer to a town centre? Check what sort of accommodation the institution has to offer, and whether it will provide it only for your first year or longer. Also, don't forget the social life. Perhaps you want to be close to some of Britain's famous theatres, concert halls, art galleries or museums. Or you may want to take part in certain kinds of sports or outdoor activities. Or simply be free to roam nearby countryside. Whatever sort of social life you're looking for, be sure to check that it's available before you sign on for a course. Finally, last but not least, money. Costs may vary between different courses. In addition to tuition fees, you should also check other costs such as books, equipment, accommodation and living costs. You may also be able to get a scholarship or other financial help. Scholarships are highly competitive, of course, but they do exist so find out if you are eligible for one. So follow this five-point plan for choosing your study course in the UK, and good luck! Exercise 7 We hear a lot these days about whales and the need to protect them, but when did this interest start? Because people have been hunting whales for centuries, haven't they? Yes, for at least a thousand years. And there were no problems until this century, really. What happened was that fishing technology became much more efficient and the ships were much faster, so more and more whales were caught. In the 1960s, the main whaling countries were killing more than 60,000 whales a year, and I think everyone began to realise that something had to be done. When did the killing begin to slow down? It was quite a slow process, and it was the environmental groups like Greenpeace that really made things change. I mean, they set out to make people aware of the fact that whales were fast becoming extinct. But even now, we don't know if this interest has come too late. If you take the great blue whale, for example, which at 30 or 40 metres long is the biggest animal there has ever been, now there are perhaps about 2,000 or so left. In fact, they have been protected for quite a long time, but there is still no sign that their population is growing. Am I right in thinking that killing whales is against the law? Yes. In fact, there was an international agreement to stop killing whales, but there are three countries which still catch whales, and they are Iceland, Norway and Japan. In fact, under the international agreement, they are allowed to catch whales for scientific research, and they use this as an excuse to carry on as they did before. What do they use the whale for? In Japan, it's quite a popular kind of food, and it's very traditional. Thank you to practice with me. See you next lesson.